everybody. Today's practice problem comes from Principles of Microeconomics by N. Gregory Mankiw, 6th edition. We're going to be doing chapter 6, problem number 1. The problem reads as follows. Lovers of classical music persuade Congress to impose a price ceiling of $40 per concert ticket. As a result of this policy, do more or fewer people attend classical music concerts? So we can think about this, and to analyze what's going on here, we need to start with a basic supply and demand diagram. So we can do that here. And we can just say, well, we're thinking about market supply and market demand. So we want to put a capital Q on the horizontal axis, and we want to put a P on the vertical axis. We weren't told anything specific about what supply or demand looked like, so the best we could do is draw our typical upward sloping supply curve and downward sloping demand curve here. Now, it might be the case because we have, you know, think about classical music, you have a theater or a concert hall, and that there's a fixed number of seats, right? So it might be the case that over some ranges, supply isn't perfectly upward sloping like this. It might be somewhat lumpy because you would either sell all the seats in a theater or a concert hall or none of them. So you might get something that's sort of a step function, but we can still look at supply this way and get something that makes sense for our general analysis. So let's think about this problem. I said, we have this notion of setting a price ceiling in this market of $40. And as its name would imply, a price ceiling is just a legally mandated maximum price that the market can charge prices lower than the price ceiling, it's just not allowed to charge prices above the price ceiling. You can't go above the ceiling, right? So we can think about on this diagram what effect this price ceiling of $40 is going to have on the market. Now, it's actually important to distinguish between what's called a binding price ceiling and a non-binding price ceiling. So we can discuss each of those in turn. Let's start with the non-binding price ceiling here. Sort of a silly case, but it's worth thinking about. So let's say we have this non-binding price ceiling. That means that our price ceiling is being set at a price that's above the normal market equilibrium. So that would mean that the price ceiling is being set at something above this equilibrium price P star here. And you could say, well, a, what effect is this going to have on the market? And the answer is none. So in this particular situation, putting this price ceiling in place, because what you'll notice is this price ceiling is just saying, you're not allowed to charge prices higher than this. And the market kind of responds by saying, wasn't gonna. So here, the price just doesn't change. And you can, you know, as a secondary point, ask yourselves, well, why would you ever see a price ceiling that looks like this? And, you know, it could make sense from a policy perspective. If you're worried about supply or demand shifting in such a way that it's going to make prices spike, you might want to put what's currently a non-binding price ceiling in place as a precautionary measure, right? So things that are binding now could become binding in the future and vice versa. But nonetheless, it's not like this non-binding price ceiling is going to cause prices to increase up to $40. That just doesn't make sense. What it's doing is it's restricting the universe of possible prices to these prices here. The original market equilibrium price was within that universe, so we're still able to have the same market outcome in terms of price and quantity. So if this $40 is non-binding, no effect. Now let's think about the opposite case where we actually have what's called a binding price ceiling. These are the ones that matter. And again, we can start with our supply and demand diagram. Now, again, we'll just draw supply and demand normally. Now a price ceiling that's going to be binding is one that's below the current free market equilibrium price. So if we were to, and we could label these guys as our price ceiling, just like this, our price ceilings are sort of represented by 
horizontal lines on our supply and demand diagram. So if our $40 were down here, what this market would be doing is it would be saying, oh, well, I want to get to this price here. So market forces keep pushing this up, but it can't get all the way to the market equilibrium price that it wants because it hits this price ceiling first. So we can think about the market's going to try to get as close to the free market equilibrium price as it can. So actually, in this market, the equilibrium price, which is only an equilibrium because of the price ceiling, so we can think of this as a steady state, but it's only a steady state because of this regulation, is going to be here. And then we can think about at this price, we have an imbalance between supply and demand, right? We have a shortage. You can label this. And the amount of the shortage is just the amount by which the quantity demanded at this price exceeds the quantity supplied at this price. We could also notice that the quantity supplied is just where this price ceiling intersects the supply curve. And the quantity demanded, of course, is where this price ceiling intersects the demand curve. So then it's worth thinking about, well, what counts as our equilibrium quantity? Well, our equilibrium quantity, our Q star, is the number of items that are actually bought and sold. And hey, guess what? It takes two to tango. It takes both a buyer and a seller to make a market transaction happen. So we can think about here, up until this quantity, we have both a buyer and a seller. But from this quantity QS out to QD, we have buyers but no sellers. If we have buyers but no sellers, hey, guess what? There aren't going to be any transactions happening. So our equilibrium quantity in this market, we could think of that as this quantity here. That supply is the limiting factor when we have a binding price ceiling. And we could see that this is actually the number of tickets that's going to be bought and sold. So in response to the specific question, when we put a price ceiling in place, whether or not the number of tickets available is going to decrease or stay the same depends on whether or not the price ceiling is binding. So if the price ceiling is not binding, the number of tickets that people can consume is going to be the same as it was before. But if a price ceiling is binding, the number of tickets consumed is actually going to be less than it was before. Because this price ceiling serves to have two effects, unless supply is perfectly inelastic, in which case you would only see an increase in the quantity demanded, you wouldn't see a decrease in the quantity supplied. But most situations don't have perfectly inelastic supply. So in most situations, you see this price ceiling not only make more people want to consume or make more people willing and able and ready to consume an item because it's now offered at a lower price. It also makes fewer of that item available because it's decreased the incentive to actually supply in the market. So what we see here is under a binding price ceiling and a very loose assumption of not having perfectly inelastic supply, we're actually going to see fewer tickets being consumed than we were before, which is just an example of a probably well-meaning policy trying to make the symphony accessible to everyone really kind of backfire, and then it results in fewer rather than more people actually attending.